Year. Happy New Year, everybody. To the, welcome back to uh, Reynolds um, Learning Series, formerly known as User Group. Uh, this is our first meeting of the year, uh, January uh, 18th, 2023. I'd like to welcome um, all the panelists and all the attendees to uh, the first, our first uh, learning series um, update of the year. And this year, or, the, or today, this month, we're doing um, an automation update. So we have, today, we have a lot of different um, topics we're going to discuss around Rockwell's technology and, and, and what's going on um, within the automation world. So um, before we get started on the automation update, I um, want to give you a preview or a, 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 of, of what we have upcoming. Um, and, and so uh, anyone that's new, um, to our to our updates, we have two different uh, types of updates. We do um, seminars that we do. We do tech talks, which uh, one one a month, and those tend to be uh, uh, shorter focused uh, discussions around maybe twenty to forty minutes. We take a specific topic. Um, later on this month, we have um, sometimes we have vendors, uh, and sometimes we pick a topic. This month we have uh, Grace Technologies is going to talk about their uh, Grace Sense. Um, you may know Grace uh, from their uh, Grace Port offerings of uh, many connect connections uh, that you may have with uh, your your control panels, um, whether that's a power connection or or a network connection or what have you. Um, they're going to talk about their Grace Sense um, product line. So look forward to that. And uh, the next couple of months, we uh, we're planning a couple of cybersecurity updates. Uh, coincides with our general topic of um, security this quarter. So look for those. Um, we'll have those lined up here shortly. And then um, later on um, in the quarter uh, next month, we're going to have a factory talk design hub learning series. Um, and then we're going to do a network and security update. And so. With our learning series, like today, um, we have a we we pick a little bit more of a generalized topic and and uh, stretch out our presentation, usually to about an hour. Sometimes we go a little bit longer. Um, so next month is pretty exciting. Uh, the, if you don't if you're not familiar with the Design Hub, that that is Rockwell's uh, cloud based um, um, uh, portal or uh, development portal, if you will, and and so. We're going to talk about the design hub and, and some of the different features uh, that are associated with it. So, so stay tuned for that. And then uh, in March, we'll do a, a network and security update where we'll talk about you know, network automation topologies and, and, and what's going on with uh, cybersecurity. So hopefully, hopefully everybody can join us for those uh, learning series as well. So let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so today, uh, my name is David Newt. I'm gonna be the first presenter today. Um, and we have several other presenters. Okay, and uh, so we have uh, Mike Masterson's gonna talk. Uh, and then uh, Wayne, uh, Wayne's gonna, gonna talk about uh, Plant PAX. Uh, Michael Lett's gonna talk about drives and uh, Kevin Peterson um, is gonna talk about industrial controls. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first topic we want to we want to approach today is uh, Studio 5000 updates. So, um, with Studio 5000, kind of a brief recap over the last few years, um, running through here. So, it's hard to believe uh, version 32 came out all the way back in 2018, but uh, these are the last three revisions. So, just to do a quick recap, uh, 33 was really a major release. So what we did with what Rockwell did in, in, uh, with the release of version 33 is um, a few major things. Number one is that's when the uh, process controllers were released, the, uh, the L8, um, what we call P controllers. So that coincided with a major um, plant PAX release of, um, of uh, the 5.0. Um, so uh, with the process controllers, that was, um, the main item there was actually embedding the process instructions inside the firmware. So uh, that's been well received in the marketplace. And so we've been down the road 
um, with plant PX50. Um, the other thing that happened in version 33 that uh, some of you may or may not be aware is, is that was when the default communications within Studio 5000 went to F factory toggle links from R Sync's classic. And uh, you're, you can still use R Sync's classic, uh, but you have to actually go in and manually change that in the, uh, the uh, communications that you want to use. So, so um, going forward now with 34 now, and then with 35 that just came out, Factory Talk Links is kind of becoming the standard communications uh, tool for uh, Studio 5000, but you can always revert back to Arsling's Classic um, if that's what you prefer. So then last year, um, we had actually two releases. So 34 was in the spring. It was kind of a, uh, I would call a minor release. Um, but one of the best, one of the, the better capabilities uh, was an improved uh, download time on the uh, on the uh, high performance um, CPUs, so the, the compact fifty three eighties and the and the L eight controllers, and uh, I have had have had some feedback from from customers in the field that did notice the difference. Um, so if you haven't used thirty four. Um, so that came out in March of last year. Um, and no, so not now I'm right around the time of Automation Fair last year, November, just a couple months ago, Rockwell released uh, version 35. So 35 is the latest. And uh, here there's a few things, um, some enhancements and support that came out with uh, 35 that we'll talk about. So, so, um, so I'll just continue on. Um, Version 35 um, is the current release, and and so so here uh, we can see some of the the uh, support and enhancements that came with 35. Um, I would call it a major release, uh, really because of the hardware support that's been added, uh, mainly the uh, Flex HA 5000, which is uh, any of the any one that went to Chicago or even Houston automation fairs uh, may have seen the Flex HA 5000. That's and we'll talk about it later in this discussion today, but it's a uh, what we call a more of a process DCS type of I/O system, more flexibility um, at the uh, at the I/O layer, and and redundancy built in. So so that so version thirty five is the first release that supports that hardware. Um, also some some guard link um, support that was added as well as. Um, uh, a new an LA uh, redundancy bundle has already been released for it, which is pretty fast. Um, there's uh, for for the batch folks on the online um, is a sequence manager um, was uh, finally added uh, to version 35 for the uh, LA um, uh, process controllers. So that we've been waiting for that for a while. Also, there was some uh, process instructions that have been expanded, and that's corresponds to the uh, 5.1 plant PX, or I'm sorry, 5.2 plant PX release that uh, happened at kind of the same time. And we'll talk about that um, in a few slides. Um, another thing um, that, that was added with 35 is uh, the expansion of the uh, controller change detection support. And so um, that was first released a while ago on uh, the older um, L7 processors. But uh, there's a couple of attributes that you can use uh, in a pro programmatically um, that detects um, and, and audits uh, the value of, um, of a change detection. So you can track um, when your program is changed. Uh, that's, also, that's also linked up with Asset Center. If you use Asset Center in your system, that's how Asset Center can, can detect changes in the controllers. We have a link here on this slide uh, to a manual that, that can help you um, build some logic around um, using the change detection attributes. That's kind of helpful. So, so um, now the L8 um, and the high performance controllers are now added to that support. Um, the other thing that Rockwell has kind of started with version 35 is to update um, the uh, add-on profiles with a user-based uh, Oh, I'm sorry, a web-based user interface. So you'll see that now, and it's they're kind of rolling it out. Um, and so this was the first rollout with, with the initial th version 35. Um, look for subsequent um, patch rollups that will add more, more uh, of, of IO modules down the road. 
but essentially um, you'll you'll get you'll you'll uh, be able to uh, to use a web based interface to um, configure the uh, the add-on profiles, and that's kind of what, what you'll see going forward with version thirty five that we haven't seen before. <coughs> Um, also, um, Logic's Echo got an update, and so I think probably need to take a step back and make sure everyone knows what Logic's Echo is. Logic's Echo is uh, the emulation tool for um, right now for our, our 5580 or um, LA controllers, the high performance um, comp control logics uh, controllers. So um, carrying forward what Logic's emulate did with the L7 controllers. <laughs> So uh, version two came out a couple months ago. There's a couple, I'd say two important aspects of the version two release. Number one is its support for the safety controllers. So now you can build a full safety and test a full safe uh, safe system uh, with, uh, guard, with uh, guard logics controllers. So that's a big step forward. Um, the other thing that I've noticed that's, that was a, a nice enhancement is the multi-chassis support. So in version one, um, if you wanted to use multiple controllers and the control, like each controller that you wanted to, uh, to use in the system was in slot zero, you couldn't do that because version one only supported a single chassis in an application. And so that's been updated now. So you can um, create mul multiple chassis in a single uh, echo instance, which you know, I think honestly, most systems that we see the, the uh, controllers are in slot zero. So that's a big en enhancement. And then also um, there's some um, motion uh, support that was added as well as uh, expansion of the, uh, of the API, um, if, you're, if you're into that. So version two has been out. Um, another thing kind of commercially, just, just to make sure everyone's aware on Logix Echo, uh, Logix Echo, unlike Logix Emulate is sold separately. Uh, so it is not part of, um, part of a developer to, or a, a, a toolkit, design toolkit, and it's only sold as a subscription. So just, just take note of that. Um, so that's different from the way Logix Emulate is, is purchased. Um, so just, just make sure you're aware of that going forward. So some more system updates, um, and a lot of this is, uh, is uh, life cycle announcements. So we'll go through these. Um, first of all, the ETAPs. Um, so Rockwell has recently announced um, that the ETAP line is going, is going to active, um, has gone from active mature to, to end of life, which what that means is Rockwell has gone into the future and estimated where they feel the, uh, the end date or the, the discontinuation stage will be. And that's a little bit a ways away. It's um, scheduled right now for, for mid to late 2024 for, uh, for, the, uh, for the current ETAPs. And so um, we are able to, to get ETAPs today. They are, you know, like a lot of things um, are an extended lead time situation, but Rockwell is still manufacturing these, um, but what's happened is kind of the, the, the good part of the story is, is Rockwell is, is redesigned, um, is redesigning the next generation ETAP that will um, include SFP ports. So we can, so in the future, in the new generation of ETAP, we will, we will be able to use um, more flexible networks uh, using uh, SFPs. Uh, for fiber, so we could use uh, multi-mode and single mode on the next generation. So look forward to that. But uh, in the meantime, in the next 18 months, um, we will will be end of life with ETAPs, and then look for next mid, mid 2024 to uh, for the ETAPs to go into a discontinued or no longer available status, with the anticipation that around that same time the uh, the next generation ITAP or ETAP should be available um, as the old ones are going away. So a uh, quick review of um, Rockwell's um, electronic operator interface or EOI is how it's known internally portfolio. So the lower cost, we have our panel view 800s. Typically uh, we use those for standalone or islands of automation 
where we're talking to a micro 800 controller, single single controller, uh, fairly simple, um, um, built for purpose type of type of HMI. Our bread and butter is um, kind of in the advanced terminals or the panel V plus seven um, standard and performance. The uh, I will say the standards uh, we've had kind of some significant um, issues procuring the standards. So we're really um, recommending performance units. Those are a lot more available. Uh, uh, the lead times are much better um, and they're both programmed the same way. Uh, the standard also has some application limitations that, that uh, could bite you. Uh, it can only talk to, with uh, standards, can only talk to one controller and have a limited number of uh, displays and, and alarms that you can use in an application. So the performance is really the right way to go. Um, with the uh, PanaV plus seven HMIs. Rockwell also does have a PanaV 5000. Uh, it's very focused uh, in the OEM markets. Uh, there's a limited um, third party connectivity or very, basically zero. Uh, it connects to a control logic or a compact logic controller and that's pretty much it. So if it's a encapsulated OEM uh, piece of equipment, it might be an option. Otherwise, if you're using an HMI to talk, you know, to a, a whole system, and there's the mobile view, which is a tethered system, mostly used in um, in discrete manufacturing, where you have um, where you have a, uh, the HMI is, is being held and tethered to to maybe a piece of equipment or an operation or something. Okay, so another, so a couple more lifecycle announcements. Uh, the Versu View 5000 series. Um, and that includes um, monitors, panel PCs, and thin clients. Um, Rockwell is fading those out, um, so they've gone end of life. Um, they've been in, out in the market for, for a number of years. Um, um, Rockwell had made an acquisition a couple of years ago uh, of a computer company, and so that's where we're, we're transitioning to, um, to the um, Awesomes or the ASEM 6300s. So those, so the, the 6300, are uh, replacing the uh, Versity 5000s. So, um, and Rockwell has rolled these out over the last really 12 to 18 months. So uh, now there is a new, um, recently released a dual display uh, thin client, 6300T thin client. There's an on-machine um, HMI or a panel PC, excuse me, that's, um, that's, that's just became available um, they are planning to release a new monitor this this quarter, and uh, and then there'll be some uh, thin manager ready BIOS updates uh, that are, that will be available here in the next couple of months on the industrial PCs. And and look for quite a few more rollouts of this product line going forward, um, as as you see. And and uh, now Rockwell has a lot more control over their industrial PC line because it is owned completely by Rockwell. Uh, so Rockwell doesn't need to partner with anybody. So we expect that to enable us to be a, a lot more custom, customizable with upcoming releases. Um, so continuing on, on that mindset. Um, so we're gonna look to see more um, industrial monitors released, the, the thin manager ready um, uh, hardware as well as um, more box PCs. Uh, there's also a, uh, a long distance option that um, I've run into some in, in some, uh, in some uh, uh, control rooms where you may wanna have a large, like maybe a large uh, display or you got a display on the wall and you wanna run that back to a PC. Um, the awesome uh, product line does have one of those that, and that, that we will, be releasing that here in the next, this quarter, and then look for more um, panel PCs and, and monitors uh, the next quarters and beyond. And at that point, uh, I think we're going to switch to to Wayne. He's going to give you guys a process update. Like David mentioned, we'll do a little process update real quick. Uh, first, my name is Wayne Well, automation specialist out of New Orleans. Um, so uh, we'll start with Factory Talk Asset Center. The uh, version 12.0 release uh, has uh, has come out, and uh, you know there's a few enhancements and a few improvements with the 12.0 release, um, mainly a, a little bit uh, more modern web-based client um, there. They they've also in, improved some security, um, kind of a uh, 
you can actually detect uh, compromised logic controllers using the uh, source code validation uh, kind of schedule. Um, and there's also some disaster recovery schedules now that work with Factor Talk Logics Echo as well. So um, we, we see more and more of the echo and the emulation um, happening. So uh, some asset center will will uh, work with that as well now. Um, so just a, uh, a little bit of a screenshot on it, just to uh, give you a picture there um, versus uh, just talking about it. So there's some interest in Factor Talk in, in Asset Center 12.0, you know, definitely reach out to us. There's, you know, we can kind of go over the, you know, more of the features and, uh, and uh, enhancements perhaps uh, from previous releases. And then Plant PX. So, you know, so Plant PX version 5.2 uh, was released around, I think, back in November timeframe. So 5.2 um, provided, uh, you know, an enhancement as far as kind of upping the, re the revision levels of the software, you know, that, that come in the part of the release. So all, you know, kind of all the latest versions of Studio and Factor Talk, View, SC, um, and Asset Center and Historian. So all those kind of get uh, get upped in those revisions. Uh, there's been a few other enhancements in the in the 5.2 uh, release as well. Um, so kind of a you know the roadmap, you know, going back, you know, so 5.0 release is, is actually has been out for quite some time since October 2021, and then um, last year we saw 5.1, and then of course the 5.2 late last year, and 5.3 will be later on the roadmap at the end of uh, this year. Um, but the the 5.2, uh, you know, there's a process controller library expansion. Uh, the release of Sequence Manager, the the new Flex HA 5000 I/O being supported in the system, uh, which is basically tied to the uh, version 35 of Studio 5000, um, as well as uh, some cybersecurity enhancements with the the support of SIP security. So SIP security um, came into the L8 controllers, uh, I think, at some point uh, towards the end of last year. And uh, so now that SIP, SIP security support is, is in Plant PX 5.2, and uh, that SIP security will give you, uh, you know, encrypted, you know, endpoint to endpoint uh, encrypted uh, communications, you know, from a controller to a uh, to a Ethernet card remote rack that also would support SIP security uh, in that Ethernet card. The uh, kind of the other big news, you know, late last year, and if you had gone to Automation Fair, was the uh, the, the release of the Flex HA5000 IO platform. So uh, this is um, kind of our, our, our next generation process IO. Uh, it's capable of uh, being fully redundant IO. It is a uh, universal IO as well. We have a, we'll have a picture of that here in just a moment. So each card is a, is a, a universal IO card. So you got really one card that you would have to uh, stock and use. Um, uh, you know, so it's like I said, fully redundant uh, in that you can go simplex or uh, redundant I/O uh, in your application, and um, uh, just uh, some other bullet points there being uh, built-in diagnostics, ease of wiring, and stuff like that. You can see it's a little bit of a radical uh, look to it compared to maybe some other I/O platforms that we've used in the past. But uh, this is the um, this is the uh, the look of what it's going to what it'll be. Uh, so on the universal I/O, I know this is something that has been long on the to-do list from Rockwell and long on the uh, desire list from from our customers and users, and that is a truly uh, universal I/O module. So this single card can be analog in or out uh, with heart. It could be discrete in or discrete out by channel. Um, so you can uh, again one card to kind of uh, do them all. Uh, it's eight isolated channels, uh, syncing and sourcing for heart. It's got a 16-bit uh, uh, analog digital analog converter. Uh, it it'll do a SIP sync for timestamps, and um, again we can apply this as a as a simplex or as redundant or duplex I/O depending on the uh, requirements of the application. And um, so again, you know, one of the benefits here is uh, one card to stock uh, and can be used for pretty much any of your, your needs. Uh, the other mention there was in 5.2 release was the uh, sequence manager. So this is, uh, you know, this has now been 
um, sequence manager is is now in the in the LA controllers. So um, you know, direct uh, phase manager program inside the logic space controller that support came to the L8 here just recently. So um, integrated with Vectortalk batch and uh, functions with the Planet PX equipment phase objects. So, um, uh, so again, if there's some interest here, reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to uh, discuss the, this new capability in more detail. And the other, uh, the other piece for me is a, a little bit of a software update. And, and that is something that you're, we're gonna really spend uh, probably a fair amount of time talking about in the near future. Um, and, and that is this uh, Factor Talk Optics um, release from Rockwell. So we, you know, so we, this is kind of the, the full portfolio look here. So, you know, we still have, you know, machine level HMI, we still have panel views, we're still using machine edition. Uh, we still have the panel view 5000 with the Studio 5000 view designer, uh, but we'll have a, a new offering here pretty soon called the Optics Panel. Uh, that will fit in that machine level HMI space. And then when it comes to scalable HMI, you know, we still have view SE. Uh, we still, of course, with the plant PX uh, using the view SE for its HMI. And we'll have factor talk optics, uh, which we can run um, as well. And then, um, you know, kind of extending beyond the HMI, we still have Fin Manager. We still have the, uh, the historian SE asset center. And now we have a... Uh, Kind of a new thing, remote access to kind of to help us uh, remotely support um, our installed installations. So uh, David had mentioned Design Hub. Uh, this is going to be our topic for next month. So um, we won't go deep at this point, but just kind of a, a real quick high level here. Um, so February learning series will be on the Design Hub ecosystem, and it's a uh, um, it's it's Rockwell's you know moving to the cloud now should be stated you know quickly and loudly that nothing is going away as far as you know we, we can still purchase a studio 5000 license and install it on a computer um we're not shifting everything to the cloud but we have the ability now to use the cloud for our design um for our design tools so studio 5000 will have a cloud-based um uh presence we can actually log into our design hub and we can go into design studio and we can actually do ladder logic or we could do you know application with a basically a studio 5000 instance that is in the cloud um, and deploy that out uh, to our our equipment in the field optic studio has will have a cloud uh, based interface as well for developing applications but once again there's still a a downloadable version that we can put onto our computer and and not have to rely on the cloud if we don't want to. And then Twin Studio, which is basically our emulation software, things like Echo, uh, things like Emulate 3D and Arena, you know, we will we, have a cloud-based instance of, of a Twin Studio where we can you know, do all of our emulation in the cloud. So it's really interesting concept. Um, it, it, so uh, I invite you February for a little bit deeper dive. The other piece of that underneath is the vault. So that'll be kind of a, a place to store uh, all of our applications. And then the uh, next layer down there is remote access. So again, if we are utilizing the cloud, we may or may not be on, on premise wherever our, our uh, equipment is deployed. So we could use um, Factor Talk remote, remote access to uh, make those secure connections uh, remotely to the industrial equipment. So optics is kind of the big, the big news, the big new release. Um, again, we, we will talk a little bit more about this next month, and you will see some road shows coming very soon uh, from Rockwell and from the Reynolds Company in Mid Coast, where we will, um, you know, have hands-on opportunities kind of coming to the branches, uh, you know, here within the next couple of months. So, um, so. It's still kind of very new for us. I know uh, most of us as, you know, from the Reynolds company, the specialists, we're still kind of getting our feet wet with optics as well. So over the next couple of months, you know, we'll all be learning together about the new, uh, this new HMI platform. But, um, you know, what makes it uh, kind of, you know, special and unique and exciting is that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is cloud-based. Uh, again, we don't have to uh, utilize cloud, but it can be cloud-based. It's a modular deployment, meaning that we can really just kind of you know, pick the components we want. So you can kind of really a la carte 
um, your applications based on uh, needs and definitely can kind of control your costs based on that. Um, it is a uh, IoT, uh, you know, so we're going to, you know, IoT capable. Uh, OPC UA is kind of a core to the platform, uh, but we're also talking about MQTT capabilities here um, with optics as well. Uh, it'll utilize uh, version control tools like the vault and even GitHub. So we see a lot of, um, you know, kind of crossover from, uh, you know, the, uh, the traditional programming world into the automation programming world. So uh, the use of GitHub here, perhaps um, to do version control and uh, open architecture. So there, you know, this will be, um, you know, some C-sharp programming can be done in it as well. So it's, you know, definitely a little bit different, uh, different look and feel for what we're used to in our uh, traditional HMI platforms with USC and VUE ME. Um, so again, like I had mentioned, you know, kind of only pay what you need. So this is kind of a, a unique feature here. You can kind of a la carte uh, what you want. So there'll be um, kind of a few standard kind of bundles, I guess, light, standard, and pro. So all based on your needs, you can kind of kind of get right sized here. Uh, and again, we'll we'll deep dive into these architectures um, in future sessions as we um, you know roll this out more extensively. Uh, last piece for optics is just knowing that uh, there are two you know kind of uh, two ways we can well I should say there's optics uh, station which is available now so that, so again optics station we can you know, this is kind of deploying it we can download studio there, there's a factory talk optics studio we can download that um, we can develop our optics applications and we can deploy it uh, or deploy it as a, a optics station on a, on a regular PC. Um, or a cloud-based, I think maybe even Linux-based machines too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in the near future, we will have an optics panel. So this will be kind of an all-in-one um, integrated display panel that we can, you know, obviously uh, panel mount or um, on, into an enclosure. And then this, is, this will give us everything we need to, uh, to run an optics application in that all-in-one unit. Um, so similar to a panel view, uh, we'll have a, uh, you know, a panel um, option for optics all in one panel. Uh, and I think this might be the last slide for me. And that's basically, you know, one thing that will probably get asked quickly uh, is what happens to VUSC? Well, VUSC is not going to go away. View Machine Edition is not going to go away. Um, optics is just another uh, piece, another uh, product offering that we will be able to offer. So, you know, Again, it's just looking at you know what's the right uh, right tool for the application, um, and Factory Talk View and Optics can kind of coexist and complement each other in certain situations. Again, uh, Optics we're talking about I you know I, IoT or IIoT type of um, stuff like MQTT protocols, um, some dashboarding, some some basic reporting. You know, Optics will do uh, you know PDF generated reporting very well. Uh, an OPC UA interoperability. So, uh, so again, there'll be some things here that, that optics will do very well. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're not um, we're not going to see VUSC go away, and we're not going to, you know, we're going to still continue to um, to look for and and uh, and really try to grow the VUSC applications as well. So consider them as complements to each other. And with that, I think we will turn it over to Michael Lett for a quick PowerFlex uh, update. Yes, hey, thank you for your time today. I, I uh, thank you for giving me a few minutes. This is Michael Lett, I'm the drive specialist for the, the uh, Reynolds company for medium and low voltage drives. Uh, just wanted to give a brief update um, uh, on power products. The, the, our main drives are the 750 series. We've got the 753 and 755, those are six pulse. Uh, active or not active six pulse uh, uh, diode rectifier front ends, um, but I don't want to spend too much on that. Uh, this the 750 series will be going long into the future. In fact, all of our technology, even in the medium voltage drives, uh, is is going to be based on this similar technology that we're they're developing with the 750 series. Uh, this this is a seven uh, as you see on the screen here is a 755 TL. 
It's the uh, it's an active front end drive. This drive is comparable to a 24 pulse a harmonic mitigation drive. So it does out of the box. It, it'll meet IEEE 519 or better. Um, you can get us with any your salesperson or any of us if you need that. Um, it is a step up, obviously, from the 753 and 755. But in that same family, <clears throat> we do have the TR, and which is a regenerative drive, uh, still an active front end. And then we have the, the TM, which is a, a common bus configuration. That common bus configuration can be configured with multiple horsepower drives. They don't all have to be the same horsepower as long as they're common bus together. Uh, they can use the regenerative characteristics to, uh, to, to feed power and save energy to one another. Um, so that, that the 755 series and 755 TL, the TL goes up to 3000 horsepower. That's in low voltage. Uh, there's talks of actually increasing that, uh, but keep in mind, we do have our medium voltage uh, for that, those needs as well. Um, some of the common components with all these drives are the, the HIM module, the IO cards, anything to do with uh, uh, communications. Um, so moving on, <clears throat> we got the uh, 755, next slide, 755 TS. The TS is, is, uh, is offers the same technology as far as the TL, with the exception this drive is a six pulse instead of the TL. The TL is an 18 or, or better pulse, 24 pulse. Uh, the 755 TS is actually gives us some uh, added features. Um, the 755 TL also offers some of these same features. I don't mean to be jumping around on you, but pretty much the only difference is the TS is a six pulse drive, but the total force technology is available in both, which allows adaptive tuning. So say for example, if you've had, uh, you've had to uh, do skip frequencies in the past, uh, with this drive, it'll, it'll automatically intelligently uh, see those, it's gotta be programmed to do this, but it'll see those uh, resonant frequencies in the process and the mechanics and actually skip over them or drive through them. Uh, it's total force control, so we do have uh, we do have feedback from the motor uh, as well on all that. Uh, predictive analytics, um, you know, we used to call it predictive maintenance, but now we're, we've moved to another level. Predictive analytics just allows us to uh, program in like the uh, uh, possible life of even the I/O cards. Uh, the fans, a lot of that can be programmed in, so it will flag either through Ethernet or, or through uh, other means, hard, hardwire communications. It'll flag that maintenance is required or going to be required to keep the whole process from shutting down. It's all about uptime. Um, so the, these, all of these drives, the 750 series, all the way through uh 753 755 tl and ts uh will can use the studio 5000 software for programming uh, we can also use the connected components workbench which is a, a free online downloadable software uh which which i use daily that's uh that's definitely a uh something that everyone should have another means for programming i don't know if i said it would be the him module as well uh, one thing I do want to leave you with is the, the TS family here. Uh, you can see the TS and then the TS down in the right-hand corner of that drive is the XT. The XT does have corrosive uh, resistance uh, up and above our standard conformal coating that's on the boards. Uh, it does have an advanced coating system, which is, is it's a special process, which is ASTM uh, B485. It's a method K approval. It's a 30 day exposure test that actually accelerates the, uh, the, the long term. Um, obviously, over, over a period of so many years, it would appear to be the process is, is extrapolated to, to uh, prove it within so many years, like five or 10 years of corrosion resistance. And that's, if you've ever opened up a, a drive or any enclosure, uh, especially around the power uh, 
power components where you see uh, the black buildup. It's, it's actually like dendrite, they call it, uh, but that's a corrosive, uh, corrosive buildup on boards that can cause failures. Uh, the XT family is, uh, takes it a, into that new level of protection so you don't have those issues for, uh, for corrosive environments, mostly like uh, um, you know, gaseous type environments and stuff like that. So it is a, a GX and a CX. Uh, it's ISA and uh, IEC standards approval to meet those. And um, um, again, I think that's uh, that pretty much sums it up. This drive, this this drive only goes to. I mentioned the other the TL goes to three thousand horsepower. Currently, this drive the TS is up to four hundred horsepower. So, but if you have any needs or any uh, uh, want to see anything further, we can even come on site and do some some product updates more in depth. Uh, this is kind of a, a quick overview, but uh, that's all I've got for today. I appreciate your time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Masterson. I'm an automation specialist out of Houston. And today I'm going to talk briefly about our small controllers. Um, before I even go to the next screen, I want to make everyone aware that the Micrologics family is dead now. It's a, it's a officially end of life. That includes the uh, 1100s, 1200s, 1400s. And um, if you haven't made the, the migration, please look at the Micro 800 line. So let's talk about that. So with the Micro 800 line, I want to make everyone aware that there is a new gen of the Micro 850 and 870. Um, these controllers have uh, built-in I.O. similar to the Micrologix 1400. But what they did is, you notice there's an E in the new part number, the 2080LX0E. Anything with the E in the part number now is going to be the new family of controllers. Um, that is all you can get these days. The older controllers are... Uh, have been uh, and put into end of life, and but these should be a drop-in replacement for any of those. The part number nomenclatures follow the same pathways, so it should be easy for any migrations. Some of the features that we have put into it is um, th there is DNP3 protocols been put into it, but we have also um, uh, enhanced our class one messaging. So this is class one messaging is what makes us be able to control our drives with a control logics or compact logics or have that real tight integration. Um, so what we they've done with the Micro 800 E series is um, they have put eight con uh, class one connections in it. So now we can actually drop in a PowerFlex 500 series or a Micro um, or a uh, one of our Kinetics 5100 servo drives and um, it have tight integration with the Micro 800. So that's actually a very, very big deal for those who uh, are used to using uh, compact and control logics. They can get almost the same type of integration with the Micro 800 and the PowerFlex 500 series now. So um, what they have is we have uh, some user-defined function blocks for the, mo for the uh, module setup. They've done one for the PowerFlex 520 series, the Kinex 5100. And they also have a generic device. Now, uh, we'll get back to you on the ge generic device profile because this is something new to me. But we might actually be able to do some rudimentary I.O. control with that block. We haven't messed with it yet, so we'll be getting back to you as we experiment with it. But the PowerFlex 520 and the 5100 um, profiles do exist, and they work very well. And as you notice, uh, the controller I.O. tree looks very similar to what you would see in a Studio 5000 environment. Um, also, uh, we've enhanced the tag structures to go with the function blocks. Um, a lot of there's a lot more predefined tags. So actually building your graphics and stuff um, has a lot. Your life has become a lot more easy, a lot less development on your part because of this. And then again, we have our drop in user defined function blocks for um, both our uh, PowerFlex 520 and our Connects 5100 servos. 
So um, if those function blocks look kind of familiar, um, we're using the same approach that we would use in a Studio 5000 environment, but we're doing it with, within a CCW type project. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin Peterson to talk a little bit about his uh, the 42 uh, 432ES GuardLink um, interfaces. Uh, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Kevin Peterson. I am Industrial Control Specialist with the Reynolds Company. And I want to introduce you to a product that Rockwell has came out. They uh, showed it at Automation Fair this past year for the first time. And what it does is give, gives a little uh, more... Uh, that gives you another choice for, for hooking up your uh, SIP safety over Ethernet IP if you have that for a project. So like I say, brand new, and uh, I'll go into uh, a, a quick review of this. Uh, basically, for everybody out there, uh, guard link uh, explanation is basically a uh, device-level safety linking technology. Uh, it connects in-series safety input devices via the guard link comms port, port protocol. Uh, allowing for device di diagnostics to flow back to your PLC via the Ethernet IP. Uh, historically, in the past, this was done by wiring auxiliary contacts to each safety input device and then landing that on an input card uh, via uh, a la home running it, if you will, uh, for each individual contact. So, of course, this is very expensive to do this with the high wiring cost and then the cost of additional I.O. cards that you need to, to land these uh, auxiliary contacts on. Uh, with GuardLink, these costs go away as it consists of pre-made cables daisy chained to each input device all the way back to the PLC, bringing you the diagnostics via Ethernet IP. So here's a picture of the brand new 432 ESIG3, uh, world's most advanced serially connected safety input solution. Uh, number one, the automatic diagnostic reporting to the HMI uh, basically is done uh, from this unit without any software development time. Uh, the diagnostics consists of internal faults, low and high power warnings, short circuit faults, guard leak signal faults, and discrepancy faults between two safety inputs. Uh, a lot of information without any, uh, any programming on the customer side. Uh, one caveat is you need to use the PanelView 5000 uh, for that uh, to work. And then, of course, uh, we are using a guard logic. Uh, Studio 5000 in it uh, with the 34 or later uh, version to have this work. Uh, once again, for projects using SIP safety over Ethernet IP, this does meet the ODVA requirements. And then also you can choose between the linear star and the DLR topologies. Uh, this device is able to be mounted on the machine directly and the IP ratings are 66, 67 and 69K. So it is good for a washdown area. Uh, it also can be stuck in the cabinet with the uh, with the uh, with the control devices as well, if, if necessary. Uh, pass cord and cord set wiring. So basically, it has its own uh, pre-made cords that come with this, and this of course reduces your wiring costs with no home runs, and then also troubleshooting. So you have one cable as opposed to multiple cables going back. Okay, so. Uh, this new device, and I mentioned the old uh, setup that Rockwell has, it still is in play and still is an option using a basically a dual channel uh, safety relay with a inter Ethernet comms card in conjunction to give you two channels. This current one gives you three independent zones and you see them numbered channel zero, one and two on the device. Those zones can handle up to 32 devices uh, for each of those zones or each channel, if you will. Uh, the zones can be used as three separate machine zones, or you can do a combination of one or two, depending on how many devices, what you need to do. Uh, separate module and output wiring. Basically, you can cascade the power. Uh, so on the bottom, you see the two little ports where you plug your power supply into one, and you can daisy chain that to another interface if necessary in your project. Uh, this also allows you to turn off the output power while leaving the module power on. Uh, you see time stamping right there. So it does basically record the activities of your input devices by giving the frequency uh, of when it went off and which device goes off. Uh, this, of course, is used to help improve 
your maintenance programs, and then also any process improvements you can get by this uh, this this uh, data. Uh, once again, our safety levels are SEAL 3 and CAT 4 PLE. So that's the highest standard as you can go. Uh, here is a visual image of the uh, 432 uh, ES. And you can see on the left where you have your control panel, the end cabinet with your controller, uh, your HMI hanging on that, and then also your, uh, your starter devices there for power. Uh, in the middle is basically a representation of what goes on your machine uh, that you need safety, uh, controlling doors uh, with uh, interlocks, uh, with uh, light curtains and e-stops, and you see the devices on there. Uh, each one of these is a different channel, and you can see it's only a trunk cord going to uh, guard lock, guard uh, link taps, and then to the actual uh, input device itself. Uh, the uh, Once again, the caveat uh, to get the ADR is having that uh, panel view 5000. And of course, you have the guard logics that you see in the in the uh, in the cabinet with version 34 or newer. Okay, and uh, Kevin, let me jump in on this for this slide. Um, sure. Again, this is Mike Masterson. I just want to show um, the integration of the system in it. So um, these t these types are uh, there's are actually add-on profiles for this device. So. The configuration and the tags have already been developed for this product. So monitoring these devices, it's just so much easier because all this stuff has been predefined. So um, what we're showing here are the um, add-on profiles for the uh, for uh, Studio 5000. So you can see how the uh, device would integrate into your standard project. So I, I want to promote this because this is a huge selling point um, if you're having to monitor your own safety system. And with that, Kevin, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Here is a visual of the input devices that you would uh, hang on these taps, uh, cable, pull switches, uh, non-contact interlocks or contact interlocks, uh, the safety switch with guard locking, e-stop buttons and light curtains is just a, a number of these. Uh, the actual guard link taps can be passive, which if you have a device that has guard link enabled uh, uh, in it already, you'd use a passive link. And if you don't, you'd basically use one that uh, is not passive and you would get uh, diagnostics from that tap itself back to your uh, PLC, even if your device is not a smart device, if it's a standard uh, push button or something like that. Basically, Mike uh, talked about the, uh, the the integration into 5000. This is basically a representation of how you'd build this system. Integrated Architect Builder, which is a free software I'm sure most of you know about. You can actually go in and build your system by inputs. Basically, you go in and you choose your device that you want to hang on here. You would choose the length of the cable that you need between the devices. You'd put that in this system and it's going to give you a uh, power requirements or a voltage drop uh, chart. And you see that to the right there if you have some really good eyes on this uh, little bitty chart. But it allows you to size your power supply to what you need for your whole system. So a really good tool. It'll help you build it. Uh, without this, uh, it's would be really, really tough to do. So we can help you with this process and go through there if you don't understand how to use Integrated Architect Builder, but it's something that is something that we can teach you and we don't mind going through on a deeper dive. Okay, so in summary, uh, the world's most advanced serial connected safety solution that allows you to save money. Uh, integrated savings uh, when SIP safety over Ethernet is required. Uh, there's no need for intermediary comms connection modules. It just goes straight to the uh, to the uh, PLC HMI and gets your information back there. Uh, reduce cabinet space by mounting the interface on the machine if you prefer to. Uh, we reduce wiring cost and cabling cost by reducing home run wiring requirements. Uh, replace that with one trunk cable and then daisy chain all the input devices on that cable back to your uh, interface. Uh, reduce downtime with time stamping. You'll know exactly when the machine went from an operational state to a safe state and then which device caused that transition to happen. Uh, ADR we already talked about and basically just allows you to transfer diagnostics without user-specific programming, uh, which saves uh, money uh, by saving time. 
Improved diagnostics reduces downtime with individual input device time stamping, uh, as we mentioned as well. So uh, that's all I have. We can do a deeper dive if you guys want to. Just contact me. Um, uh, the information will be on there. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, I guess the final topic here, we have a training update. And uh, so, um, you know, as, as hopefully everyone knows, um, Reynolds is your is your connectivity to uh, Rockwell training. And so this is a list of uh, all the learning plus um, available training classes that we have, um, you know, notice and control drives, motion, HMI, even plant PAX, safety, um, Viva legacy products. So, um, and this is kind of an eye chart, but just to give you an idea, um, these classes are available in different formats. So, so there's uh, some of these are virtual available, um, and then the rest of these are are, are what we call in person or uh, e-learning classes. So, so quite a quite a quite a few. I guess that's our last slide. Um, it is. Don't know if there's anything else. If anybody had a chance to look at the chat, if there's anything in the chat. If not. Um, they were come up, up to that time. I appreciate everyone's attention and uh, look forward to, uh, to the next uh, learning series next month. Thank you very much.